I think all systems are go on this recording and everything else, so we're going to go ahead and get moving on with the lesson here. We're still talking about being created in Him for good works from Ephesians 2, which is true. The reason for which He made us was so that we would be active for Him, active in His kingdom, as the song said, that we might share these words, this message with others for whom He also died, and uh, other things that we do. We come together in the love of God, and we also come together in the love of our neighbors, and uh, you know that's doing as well. These are some of the good works that we're in, that are enjoined upon us. So, I'm going to look today at the fig tree that occurs in the Gospels. The first one is in Luke 13. If you are headed that way, you're headed in the right direction. But the fig tree is, you know, not a um, year-round kind of fruit. It has, you know, a season when it's got leaves on it. It has a season when it's producing figs and uh, a time when it's not doing so, right? But Luke 13 is one place. where we look at a fig tree that has had a season. It's, it's, you know, what is it? Well, you know, it's time. It's time for the fig tree to to produce. And it's in Luke 13, verses 6 through 9, which we look at here together. He told, Jesus told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, For three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, leave it alone this year too, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And that's the parable. The fig tree. And the whole point of the parable, you know, is what the... The vine dresser said um, at, at verse 9, if it should bear fruit. That's the bottom line is uh, the fig tree is named the fig tree because of the figs. You know, that's, that's what you want from the fig tree. Um, what else are they good for? They're good for wasps, but nobody wants those. Almost nobody. There's um, some entomologist is listening. No offense. <laughs> but we want the figs, not the wasps. There's a reason for having a fig tree, and that reason is figs. It's supposed to be bearing fruit, but three years now it has not done so. And the owner of the vineyard is thinking, well, that's, you know, that should be enough time. It's time to get rid of this tree. It's not working. This isn't working out. And, of course, the vine dresser stands in and says, oh, let, you know, let's do some things that shore this up, right, that help. And um, this is the parable. It hangs on if it should bear fruit. Will it come to bear fruit? It didn't do so on its own. Will it do so with help? If even with help it's not going to bear fruit, well, then it's going to be Taken down, taken out, no more, time's up, you know. (laughs) So that's the the meaning of the parable. I think it's fairly straightforward on that deal. As for the fig, um, you know, the fig tree is being planted not in the fig orchard or (laughs) in the backyard. It's planted in the vineyard. The vineyard is where you grow grapes, you know. So is this the place for a fig? Or is this not the place for a fig, you know? I mean, you may not expect to find a fig tree when you go to a vineyard, but is there some problem with having a fig tree in a vineyard? I'm not aware of one. Uh, It's certainly different from the grapes. Grapes are vines. Um, The fig tree is a very different kind of, well, I was going to say a different kind of animal, but that's not what it is, is it? I better leaf that one alone. 
Uh, it's a different kind of plant, and it's very clearly different from the things that are in this vineyard. Uh, so, you know, maybe the reason there's only one of them is because the owner of that land is thinking, you know, figs might be more profitable. Let's see, can we grow figs there? And he puts one down to see whether he can or not. And so far, it looks like the answer is no, that's not going to work out. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's just there to refresh the workers, you know. They can get figs, they can eat, and have a little snack to keep going. That's a nice thing to do. Maybe the, maybe the landowner is a nice guy. Whatever it is, it's clearly a little bit different from the others. It's clearly there with some reason that's not intimated to us, but there's some reason that the landowner had this tree planted in the first place. He had some intent for it, but clearly whatever that intent is, it requires and, and necessarily hinges upon it bearing fruit. That's the bottom line. The seventh verse there, he, the, the master, the, the landowner said, um, yeah, three years now, it says, look, three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? Uh, it's not an unreasonable expectation, you know. He owns the vineyard. Uh, he puts a fig tree there. He gives the tree some time to grow up out of whatever that is for a tree. I, I, I really should have thought of these metaphors before getting into this lesson. Uh, to get out of infancy, but what would that be? Saplinghood, I don't know. It gives it time to get more than just a smallish plant, something where, you know, you have a reasonable expectation of fruit on this fig. But three years now, Nothing. There's been chances for it to bear fruit, you know. There's been seasons. You say, well, maybe that wasn't a good year. Fine, there's another year. Oh, maybe that wasn't a good year. Okay, fine, there's another year, you know. Still no fruit. What does it mean? It means God gives us time. You know, the, re the expectation is not unreasonable when he's asking us to do things, to produce things, to, to become strong enough. You know, people, I, I think of, uh, you know, being a parent, um, especially being the parent of a teenager, people uh, who haven't had children look at that and say, oh, I can't do that. And I would say, well, you're right. You can't do that. But you have, you know, a 13-year runway. <laughs> That's how that is. You got a 13-year runway. You have the baby, and 13 years later, they turn into a teenager. And you have 13 years of parenting experience before that. Um, not to say that that's handled and that's easy and I'm a perfect parent. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's, it's true. You wouldn't start that way you know, without having some experience in parenting. But it's also true that you don't generally start that way. God gives you time to grow just as the child has time to grow. And it's true here too. Whatever it is that God has put upon us is something that we can handle. He's given us the time to mature and to grow. He has expectations of us that are reasonable expectations. We have had opportunities to uh, spread our, our wings, had opportunities to make the effort. He allows us to be tested is what it comes down to, and he watches that test. When we say he allows us to be tested, on the one hand, we're he lets us suffer. He, he, um, in some sense, he lets us be put to the test where we're being counted on for something. We have to do something. We're, we're the, the vital link of the, in the chain that this has to be done or it's not going to happen. God allows that to happen to us on the one hand. On the other hand, the test is a real test. He chooses not to know the outcome. He's watching to see what, we were, what we're going to do. Uh, we know this from Genesis when God tests Abraham, telling him to offer his son Isaac. When Abraham does it, the first thing that the angel of the Lord says, now I know that you fear God. And that makes no sense unless... It means exactly what we're saying, that God 
does test his servants, and he does wait to see the outcome. As for this fig tree that's had three years, why does it use up the ground? You know, true, it's the, it's the Lord's, you know, these are the Lord's resources. We're breathing God's air. We're, we're living the power, you know, our breath of life, our spirit of life. That comes from God too. This is God's time, God's world, the opportunities God has given us to do his work. He expects a return. He expects to find some fruit on that tree. And I've likened it to Luke 8, 13 in the parable of the sower, where some of the seed fell on ground that was rocky soil. And in the parable of the sower at Luke 8, 13, there are plants who have grown up in shallow soil. There's rock underneath, which is to say that God is allowed to go this far and no further. Right? I'm willing to give some, but not all. And uh, they have no root, it says in Luke 8, 13. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. Well, there's time, but nothing happens. They're there, but they're not producing anything. And as the Lord said, why does it use up the ground? Let's, let's get rid of this thing. There comes a time when the test is over and we haven't passed it. That is possible. I don't want that in my case or your case, but it's true that God expects us to do something. Now, the vine dresser um, here back in Luke 13 did say in the, in the eighth verse that he would dig around it and put on manure, which is to say uh, fertilizer and I guess aeration, probably more water, um, things that you do to try and make it more favorable for this plant to succeed. So he's going to build it up. He's going to shore it up, going to help to try to get the fig tree to bear fruit. That's what a vine dresser is doing here. And, um, you know, up to this point, it was kind of on his own, and that just wasn't working out. So now the vine dresser is helping it. And this is exactly what happens. Jesus is clearly the vine dresser. And the owner of the vineyard is the Lord God himself, the Father. Jesus, at 1 John 2 and verse 1, is our advocate with the Father. Our advocate, meaning our uh, lawyer, if you will. But the person who is at your side, who's presenting your side, uh, your representation, your counsel, your delegation, your advocate, your lawyer, um, that's what Jesus is for us, and that's what he's doing. He, he also is helping us to overcome, helping us, giving us opportunity and strength, helping us to carry the load, as he said, take my yoke upon you, so that we should bear fruit. But even then, you know, we do have to bear fruit, <laughs> He helps, you know, it's been three years, now it's going to be, you know, let's see if when the, the time comes around, the season comes again, is there going to be fruit this year or not? And the Lord had said, this isn't working, it's going to be, you know, cut down. And Jesus said, let me help this year too, and then if it bears fruit, that's good. We did it, right? But if not, you can cut it down. It's God that we reckon with when it comes to the judgment of our lives. It's God who is going to be making that final cut. So, you know, is three years the right amount of time? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it's just a parable, so let's not make too much out of the time, but you think about that with regard to a fig tree, you know, the fruit that comes when the vine dresser intervenes on behalf of this fig tree, if it comes, it's going to come after the third year, you know, about three and a half years, which is, you know, a year, years, and half a year, 
if you're into that kind of thing. Just to say, there's, there is a time. There, there comes a time when it's about the right time. But what is buying us that time is Jesus. Right? Jesus is our stay of execution. Our sins have uh, put us in that position where we need forgiveness. We, we stand condemned if we don't have a plea, and Jesus becomes our plea. We, we who obey him can obtain forgiveness in him, and we have a stay of execution. That's what it is to be saved. You're, what are you being saved from? You're being saved from the condemnation that is rightly due for the wrong that we have done. But with him being that vine dresser who gives it more time, who gives it help, and with him being the stay of execution for us, well, how much runway should we, should we use up? As Romans 6 said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Uh, may it never be. It's not the way to live. So that's one thing in season, when we expect the fig tree to bear fruit. Now, there's also out of season, which is captured for us in another gospel, Mark and chapter 11. The fig tree is also out of season in Mark 11, but you know, there's something else happening in Mark 11 that is the big deal, which is Jesus is arriving in Jerusalem. This is the, what is called the triumphal entry. And you have it captured for us in Mark 11. It's captured in three days. Well, at the 7th, down through the 11th, you find in Mark, Mark chapter 11, verses 7 to 11, they brought the colt to Jesus through their cloaks on it. He sat on it, and many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they'd cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Okay, but this is the triumphal entry. They're shouting Hosanna to God in the highest. These are quotations from the Psalms, but they are realizing that the king, the son of David, is here. Now, I understand, as, as any, you know, anybody does in retrospect, that they may not have understood the nature of that kingdom, the, the nature of that king being a spiritual one, but they understood that the, the prophecies were coming to pass, and this was the son of David, and he was come to be the king. And this is the path that John the Baptist prepared when he was preaching about him, making straight the path of the Lord. This is it. Here he comes. The king is here. You know what it means. It means it's time. Here he is. This is the time. Whether you, know, whether you were ready for this, whether you were expecting this, right? He's here. It's time. This is go time. That's day one. On day two, which is... Oh, about 12. Uh, well, it goes down from there, but let's just get 12 to 14 for the moment. On the following day, when they came back from Bethany to Jerusalem, he was hungry because he had gotten there late last night and just retired. Now he's going to eat. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And he said to the fig tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So the first point here on day two is the disciples heard what he said. He cursed the fig tree. And this is all done for our benefit. The clue to that is verse 13, he went to see, you know, he saw in the distance a fig tree and leaf. He went to see if he could find anything on it. He doesn't need to look. He's Jesus, the Son of God. 
He's doing that for our benefit. Again, he allows us to be tested, and he waits to see the outcome. And he wanted the disciples to see that he was inspecting the fig tree, and he had expectations for this fig tree. But when he went to look at the tree, as it said at verse 13, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. It was not the season for figs. Which is an interesting thing to say. (laughs) On the one hand, we think, well, the fig tree does have seasons. That's true. And there's a time of year when you expect it to have fruit, and there's a time of year when you don't expect it to have fruit. That's true. But the question is, you say it's not the season for figs, but that's not that's not the question. The question is, is it time or is it not time? <laughs> is the king here? Are we on the king's business? Right? Whose schedule are we on? Does the fig tree di- dictate our season? Or does the Lord, the king, dictate our season? Right? Is it time or not? Because when he arrived, all the people knew that the scripture said it was time. But the fig tree says, oh no, it's not the season. That doesn't fit me. That's not convenient for me. That that doesn't go with my schedule, with my cycle, with my, uh, you know, plans. But, you know, sometimes that's the way it is. We're serving God. We're on God's schedule. We're on God's time. The apostles heard this, it says, for our benefit, because they're also going to see his words come true before their very eyes on the third day. But it's said because we are to understand they saw this, they got this, they heard it, it's being recorded for us for this reason. And they're not the only ones who heard If you keep going in chapter 11 of Mark, you come to the place where he enters the temple. In the 15th verse, they came to Jerusalem. He entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons and wouldn't allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, isn't it written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? but you have made it a den of robbers. Those are two different quotes from the prophets. The 18th verse, the chief priests and scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. See, the chief priests and the scribes heard it too. The apostles heard what he said to the fig tree. And now that he's in the temple, and undoing all these things that have stood for a very long time. The chief priests and scribes who allowed it to stand for a very long time heard what he said. They heard it. And when he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, you know, the the word to the fig tree comes true the following day. Third day, that fig tree is cursed, it's gone. When will these words come true, that God's house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? When will that be done? They heard it, but when will that come true, right? That's the thing. We should not be doers of the word, or I'm sorry, we should not be hearers of the word only, fooling ourselves, but doers of the word, as James said. Well, yes, in the third day, it's recorded. 20th verse, beginning down to 22, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. And begins to teach them about the power of faith from there, but that's our point, and we'll... we'll You know, we'll make that point right there. Our trust is to be placed into God. 
what is it, you know, what is that saying? Well, it's saying that the fig tree, uh, being, if you will, out of season, not ready when the master arrived, not ready to bear fruit when the king came and the day was here and it was time. The meaning of that is disbelief. It's a lack of faith, a lack of trust. You know, this one had nothing to show when the master came back. He's like the one talent man that, that buried that, you know, half a million dollars in the ground instead of getting a return on it. The master came back, he had nothing to show for it, and he was punished. And the Lord does come at a time, perhaps, when we don't expect. Both in the big picture of when our lives end or when the world ends, but also in small. We don't know when we're going to be called upon to do something in God. Who will need help? Who will need charity? What, um, you know, what needs to be taken care of among the saints? Uh, you don't know, but you have to be ready to bear fruit when the time comes, when the master arrives, when you're called upon, uh, rather than, you know, having your own timetable, your own schedule, your own when you think that you'll be ready. Um, you know, get ready, because the Lord is coming. <laughs> and when he says have faith in God, it's to say our trust is to be there, not in, you know, whatever else, in ourselves and our uh, and our timetable and what we've observed and what we see in nature and what you know people expect, what seems normal, whatever, that, that's not where it should be. It needs to be in God. Or we're not ready when he comes. And we don't know when he comes. And we don't know when we'll be called upon. And, and, and then it just can't be done. It could have been done if I had been getting ready, if I had believed God that he might be here at any time. If I had believed God that he was going to expect to reap where he had not sown. That I need to be busy. I, I need to be making sure that I can accomplish something on a moment's notice for him. And yeah, that happens on the third day. Interesting. But there's two fig trees, right? There's one in season, there's one out of season. But what you find is either way, whether in season or out of season, there is an expectation of fruit. There's an expectation of bringing something forth, of doing. I want to look in conclusion at Romans 9 and Hebrews 11 together to draw the same conclusion that Jesus drew when he said, have faith in God. In Romans 9, the point is that God's word never fails. Oh, one of the fig trees that was in season and should have produced wasn't producing. Another fig tree that was out of season and maybe you thought wasn't supposed to or shouldn't be expected to have fruit was expected to have fruit. They're both kind of anti-types, you know. But Romans 9 verse 6 says it's not as though the word of God has failed. The word of God has not failed. Even if individuals in Israel failed, or the nation of Israel failed at times, which is true, as the church has failed at times. But that's not God. It's not God's word. His word has not failed. And one of the examples that he gives of this is verse 9. This is what the promise said about this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. In the, in the context of that quotation from Genesis, God is saying to Abraham when he's about 100 and Sarah's about 90, <laughs> that I'm coming back a year from now and you will have a son by Sarah who had all her life been barren, not unable to bear a child, the only child that this couple had was that, you know, if you will, surrogate child through Hagar, her servant. Abraham had a child by her servant. 
But God came to them and said that there is a son of promise. That this is going to be Isaac. His name means laughter because Sarah laughed at the idea that she would have a child when she was 90 years old, <laughs> which admittedly is kind of funny. <laughs> and God even knows that it's funny when you read the account. Why did Sarah laugh? She said, oh, I didn't laugh. He said, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> it's kind of funny. He knows. And yet, it's true. It is what happened. She did have a son, and they named him Laughter to remind themselves why we shouldn't laugh. God can do anything he wants. And in fact, there's a joy in having this son of promise that does elicit laughter as well. So you can turn it into lots of things. But the word of God doesn't fail is what we mean. God produces when he says he's going to produce. Our trust is in him when he says that this will work and you can do this. Well, it will, and you can. Uh, that's the meaning of it. And the comment at Hebrews 11 on this topic is also useful in closing, which is just verse 11 by itself. Hebrews 11, 11, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. It's what Jesus said, put your trust in God. And the right time is any time. <laughs> any time is the right time when our trust is in God. Sarah received power to conceive, which should have been impossible, but with God all things are possible. She received that power by faith. She trusted. What did she trust? It said she considered him faithful who had promised. She trusted that he was faithful. She reckoned that he was trustworthy. Though she was past the age, it wasn't the time, it was not the season for figs. <laughs> but a fig she would have. She considered him faithful who had promised. How do we receive that power to accomplish what we cannot do now? We receive that power by faith, trusting in God. That's it. See, she was out of season too. Abraham and she were out of season. That was well beyond uh, consideration at that time of life, but nope. God has his times, and this is the time, and the master has shown up, and he said, here it is. And when our trust is in him, we can do it. And with our trust in him, we work, for the night is coming. <laughs> Appreciate your kind attention. Today, you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus. It's time. It's time to obey the gospel. Today is the day of salvation. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins that you might have working for you, that vine dresser who took pity upon the fig tree. Jesus, the advocate with the Father, who will work on your behalf to help you overcome temptation, to help you overcome sin, to mediate between you and him. If today you are a Christian but have not lived right, repent. Make things right with God by prayer and genuine repentance in the heart and resolve to do the right thing. We think of all the things that are recorded in 2 Corinthians 7 that events repentance. But if we can help you with our prayers, we're glad to pray for you that you might be restored because nobody is above temptation and nobody has achieved sinless perfection. We all need the blood of Jesus. We all need forgiveness, and we'll help one another on to God. If you need our prayers today, if you need to obey the gospel, please let your need be known by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song that's been selected.